Good morning, Hope Church. Thank you so much for the joy and the privilege of joining you uh, in this series on revival. And today, I'm going to talk about the role that the Word of God plays in revival. And to do that, I want to invite you to go with me to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses, I'm going to read for you verse 1 to verse 18. It's a rather long passage, but it will give us the context in which we are going to talk. So, right? so Nehemiah chapter 8, starting from verse 1. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the Lord of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood the whole list of people whose names are very difficult to pronounce. Then Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and they responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the Lord of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. See how they were convicted by the word of God. Nehemiah then said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's where we get that phrase, right? The joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calm all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that have been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention again right, to the words of the law. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, which is actually the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country, bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, from mito, palms and shade trees, to make temporary shelters as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the court of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites have not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the Lord of God, and they celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Let's bow and we have a word of prayer. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you open our eyes to behold the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray that your word will become so precious to us in a season of revival that we will not only read your word, reflect on your word, but we also respond to your word in obedience. So come and speak to us today in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Nehemiah chapter 8 talks about a great revival during the time of Nehemiah. See, by this time, the temple of God has been rebuilt under Ezra the high priest. The walls of Jerusalem were completed under Nehemiah the leader, and the homes of the Israelites have come up within the city walls. In other words, 
all the infrastructure and system of government is already in place. But despite all of its apparent orderliness, Nehemiah could still sense that there was a spiritual vacuum amongst the people. And herein is a lesson for all of us already. We can have a beautiful church building, well-organized structure, strategic management, elaborate programs in the church. But despite this massive infrastructure, we can still be a pathetic imitation of the glorious church that Jesus Christ is coming back to receive. Isn't that right? And at the end of the day, we know this, that structure determines the size, but it is spirit that determines success. The Church of Jesus Christ is ultimately a spiritual house. And to be a house of God, the life of God must descend. The dry bones must come alive. The altars of our heart must be set on fire. And the rain of God must fall. The wind of revival must blow. And when the rain of revival begins to blow over the people of God, we are going to see some signs of revival. And I want to take the time now to outline for you three signs of revival. Now, if, if God is truly moving in our church, if God is truly reviving us, what should we see? Number one, we should see a return to the assembling of God's people. You see, throughout church history, whenever there's a revival, we will see lost sheep flocking back to the fold. We will see backslidden Christians beginning to slide back to the church. See, and one good gauge of our spiritual passion is really our desire to be amongst God's people. You see, when our hearts are cold or going astray, one of the first signs will be this. We become uncomfortable in the presence of fiery hot Christians. You know, we don't want to be around people like Pastor Jeff because he's too hot to handle. You know, you begin to feel like an uninsured man walking into an insurance conference surrounded by thousands of passionate insurance agents. How would you feel? Very uncomfortable, isn't it? But when a man is on fire, he longs to be amongst the people of God. He loves to talk about the things of God. He wants to be involved in the work of God. See, it is not that we don't talk about other things in, in normal conversations, but if our hearts are so full of God, so full of His church, when we interact, it will simply overflow out of us. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says this, Out of the abundance of the heart, what will happen? The mouth will speak. It's like after this service, we all go outside for a cup of coffee. And then if, I'm, if I have a cup of coffee in my hands and then you bump into me, what's going to spill out? Milo? Of course not. It's going to be coffee, right? What we are full of, we will overflow. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul put it this way. Do not be drunk with wine, but be being filled with the Spirit. And then what will happen? You will speak to one another in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So when you find yourself giving excuses for not wanting to come to a service or to a cell group or a prayer meeting, watch out. You know, it's not good for us. Now, I constantly have this question thrown at me when I travel, you know. Can I be a Christian and not join a church? No, my standard answer has always been this. It is possible, but you'll be like a student who refused to go to school. You're like a soldier who don't want to join an army. You're like a citizen with no country, a salesman with nothing to sell. You're like a politician with no party, a trombone player without an orchestra. All you could make is paw, paw, paw. You're like Nasulama with no chili. You know, something is missing. But if you truly love God, you will love His church. Now, here's a saying that I, I want to leave with you, you know. Remember this, huh? The banana that leaves the bunch gets eaten. In other words, nobody eats bananas by the bunch, right? But to eat a banana, what do you do? You first detach it from the bunch, and then you slowly skin the fella, and then you eat it. See? So what's my point? My point is this. The man who isolates himself from the body actually puts himself in spiritual danger. So my challenge to all of us is this. Stay connected to the church. and Belong to a small group. See? Here, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, when the wind of revival began to blow, all the people exempted as one man in the square before the water gate. See, when the wind of revival begins to blow, the Israelites came as one man before the Lord. In other words, there was a return to the assembling of God's people. This is one of the signs of revival. There was a regathering of the body. 
I think about the early church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, where the scripture says, Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And then what happened? The Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. I have a feeling that in the early church and the apostles stand up and then they announce to the people, today we're going to have, tomorrow we're going to have another meeting. Everybody will shout hallelujah. Today, Pastor Jeff get out and say, tomorrow we're going to have another meeting. Everybody go, ah, yeah. Recently, you know, I, why? But it's in a time of revival. Everybody longs together. I think about the Reformation under Martin Luther, where we see the people of God flocking back to a church that is alive with truth. I remember the Wesley Brothers Methodist Revival when we see the people gathering in class meetings all over England seeking to live sanctified lives. Personally, I've been through the charismatic renewal in the 1970s and 80s where we see people really returning to a church that is alive in the spirit. And here's something that we read in the revival under King Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29 verse 3. In the first month of the first year, in other words, that's the priority. In the first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah opened the doors of the temple of the Lord. See, sooner or later, revival always creates a rush for seats in the house of God. See, when the wind of revival starts to blow, every seat in this house will be filled. And why not? After all, the local church is the most powerful institution on the face of this earth. Do you, do you realize, my friends, that you actually belong to the most powerful institution on the face of this earth? You know, I love this story that was told about how during a Rotary Club meeting, all the new members were asked to stand up and say something about their job. But what they didn't know was that the pastor of the local church had just joined the club. And so when they got to him, they said, Sir, stand up, tell us something about what you do. And the pastor said, Are you sure? He said, Yeah, 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 tell us what you do. So he stood up and he made this amazing speech. I'll read it for you um, word for word. This is what he said. He said, I'm with a global enterprise. We have branches in every country in the world. We have our representatives in every government and every boardroom on earth. We run hospitals, universities, schools, soup kitchens, publishing houses, nursing homes. We run radio and TV station. We care for our clients all the way from birth to death and even beyond. And, and by the way, our products are all free because after all, no one can afford to buy it. But we do life insurance and fire insurance. We perform spiritual heart transplant. We do the ultimate complete makeover. Our founding chairman owns all the real estates on earth, plus an assortment of planets, galaxies, and constellations. He lives everywhere, he knows everything, and he's engaged with everybody. Our CEO, however, is born in a small town, worked as a carpenter, never owned a home, was misunderstood by his family, hated by his enemies. However, he walked on water. He was condemned to death without a trial, but he rose from the dead. Now, you may ask, how do I know? Well, I just reported to him this morning. <laughs> That's the local church, isn't it? And no wonder, you know, a famous um, author once said, there is nothing like the church when it is working well. See, when revival comes to town, the Spirit of God will stir up the hunger of His people. A spiritual hunger will begin to ferment inside of us. People will beat a line back to the church where the bread of life will be freely given. Now, this brings me to the second thing in revival. Not only will we see a re regathering of the people of God, a return to the regathering of the people of God, but we will see a restoration of the Word of God. One Bible scholar pointed out you know, that it is significant that in this chapter on revival, the people gathered at the water gate, since water is a picture of the Word of God. So before we ask God for a revival, we must first be re -bibled. See, in Nehemiah chapter 8, we see the people beginning to restore honour to the Word of God. Can you picture the scene as we read it earlier? The people were gathered as one man in eager expectation. The word of God was attributed a high place on a raised platform. Then Ezra, the high priest, appeared 
with the book of the law, which has not even been read for 13 years. He took it out from the temple, blew the dust off, and he brought it before the people. There was an awesome silence as Ezra stepped up to the pulpit. Then he opened the scriptures slowly, and the people spontaneously, you read it, right? The people spontaneously stood to their feet. And then Ezra began to read the Word of God strongly, purposefully, clearly. Then the Bible tells us that he read and he read and he read. He never stopped reading from morning all the way till noon. And the most amazing thing was not just the fact that he read for so long, but the people listened attentively and they responded enthusiastically, shouting, Amen, Amen, as they heard the word. And the, wa the word was like water, washing the people through, through and through, cleaning them. You know, we need to ask ourselves, you know, do we take a bath in the Word of God? Now, some of us do, reading long passages of Scripture. Others of us take a shower, we read a passage here and there. Some of us just dry clean, you know, a verse a day keeps the devil away. But what happened that day was that the people were having a real spa in the Word of God. And then gifted teachers begin to teach the Word to the people, line upon line, precept upon precept. They instructed the people, making the Word clear. And then with understanding came strong conviction. And the people began to weep in repentance. What a picture. The Word, the wind of revival, can sweep people by the masses back to the church. But I want you to know that it's only by the Word of God that a revival can be sustained. And this is proven true in historical revivals. For example, the revival in Wales under Evan Roberts in the 19, early 1900s started very powerfully, but there was also a greater number that fell away after the peak of the revival in 1904. Why? I'll tell you why. The centrality of preaching the Word gave way to unusual events and supernatural manifestations like angelic sightings, dreams and visions, etc. Now, I'm not against all this. In fact, I believe we need more of such supernatural manifestations. But after a while, what happened in that revival was the Word of God was neglected and the winds of revival began to die down. Today, if you return to Wales, the church is only a shadow of what it was during the revival. But on the contrary, you find that the revivals under Whitfield, Wesley, Spurgeon, they continued much longer because biblical preaching was at the centre of the revival. And here, in Nehemiah chapter 8, we see a mighty restoration of the Word of God. And brothers and sisters, this is what we need to see in our nation today. Someone put it this way, there is only one great issue, and that is to get the truths of the Bible into the hearts of the people. Because if we do not saturate our homes and our schools with God's Word, our TV, movies, mass media, internet, will saturate them with the philosophies of this world. So church, let us restore honour back to the Word of God. I like this. Um, story that Lauren Cunningham told in his powerful book entitled The Book That Changed the World. He's talking about how the Bible has impact in the nations. He talked about different nations that were transformed by the power of God's Word. And one such city that caught my attention was the city of Geneva. Now, we all know that the city of Geneva is now famous, right, for the Geneva Convention. It is the international headquarters of the Red Cross. It's the home of quality Swiss watches like Rolex and Patek Philippe. But do you know that it was not like that in the past? Because in the past, the city was famous, not for all these things, but it was famous for being the smelliest city in Europe. Why? Because there is a river that runs through the city and the down and outs, the criminals, the homeless, they were all gathered around that river in the city and it became the smelliest city in Europe until John Calvin came along. We all know John Calvin was the founder of systematic theology, and he was actually born in Geneva. And he began to teach the people the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. And he taught them about work ethics, biblical work ethics. He talks about diligence, integrity, discipline. He taught them that God hated usury, lending with high interest. And as a result, for 20 years, 
Geneva kept their bank interest rates at 4%, which is high enough for those who put their deposits in the bank to get something back, and yet low enough for business people to borrow and then make money, you see. And the economy, as a result, began to turn, and the city began to change and evolve to what it is today. But where did it start? It started with the transformative power of the Word of God. And brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you. We need to take this Word of life seriously. We admit it to be the truth. We commit it to our hearts. We submit ourselves to it, and then we transmit it to the world. And that will be the beginning of an old-time Holy Ghost revival. Here's the third sign. The third sign of revival is that through the Word, there was a rediscovery of the Feast of Tabernacles. As the Israelites looked intently into the Word, the next thing they did was not only to read it, but to obey it. And what they did was to reinstate the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the Scriptures actually tell us that they have not been celebrating it like this since the time of Joshua. And it's very significant that this specific Feast of Tabernacles was mentioned in the context of revival. To fully appreciate this, we need to understand the prophetic significance of this feast. The Feast of Tabernacles is recorded in detail for us in Leviticus 23. Now, this is a feast that the Israelites will celebrate to remind themselves of how God took care of them while they were in the wilderness. And during the times of this feast, the Israelites will come out of their homes and live in booths that are, or tents that are made of palm leaves. Now, even right up to today, if you go to Israel in September, that's what they will be doing. There will be seven mornings of symbolic celebration with music, song, and dance. Then the high priest would lead the people in a great marching procession to the Pool of Shalom, which is mentioned in the, Bible, in the Gospels, and the people will be waving palm leaves and rejoicing. Then the priest would take a golden pitcher and he goes to the pool of Shalom and he draws water out of that pool. And this, and as a priest draws the water out of the pool, we are reminded of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And then he led the people, interestingly, through the water gate and then into the temple. Then he'll take this pitcher of water and he pour it out at the base of the altar. And this water that is poured out signifies the rain that God will send to them in His mercy while they were in the wilderness. You see, and the people would then raise a great shout of joy to the Lord. Now, herein is the greatest significance of the Feast of Tabernacles for us today. The seasonal rains that God sent to Israel is typified by this water. We need to remember that Israel is an agricultural nation and they depend on rain. And there are two seasons of rain that coincides with two seasons of harvest. See? Um, and so if you look at the chart that you see now on, on, the, on in your screen, you realize that there are two seasons of rain in Israel. Uh, one is called the former rain or the early rain and the other is called the latter rain, which is... Um, the, um, the rain that comes later, okay? And when the former rain comes, which is around the period of April, it will coincide with the Feast of Pentecost. Sometimes it's called the Autumn Rains. And they coincide with the Feast of Pentecost, and that's the time when the children of Israel will harvest the corn, the wheat, and the barley. And then we have the latter rain, which happens around September, which coincides with the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's the time when the children of Israel will harvest the fruit, the wine, and the oil. So those are the two seasons of rain, the two, the two feasts, and the two seasons of harvest. Now, all the rain here speaks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as in the book of Joel, Hosea, and James. For example, James chapter 5, verse 7 reads like this, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. So he's talking about the end times. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield his valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains or the early and latter rain. And in relation to the Lord's coming, James spoke about the former and the latter rain. 
Joel chapter 2 also prophesied that in the last days, there's going to be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will cause our sons and daughters to prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, in the last days, there's going to be mighty signs and wonders following. And along with that outpouring in the end times, there's going to be a mighty ingathering of the fruit of the land. There will be a mighty harvest of souls worldwide, including the mega cities and the 1040 window. Hallelujah. And I want you to know that you cannot help it when the wind of God begins to blow, when there's a restoration of the Feast of Tabernacles, an understanding of the Holy Spirit, people are going to come flocking to the gospel. Do you know that by the year 2030, the number of Christians in China is going to overtake that of the USA? You see, there's a mighty harvest of souls that is happening right now. Do you know that the spiritual birth rate today is three times that of physical birth rate? In other words, for every one baby that is born physically, three are being born again spiritually. And we give God all the glory for this. See, when the winds of revival begin to blow, evangelism will just take place spontaneously. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know that you and I are living in these days of the latter rain. And over the last decade or so, we have seen mighty outpourings of the Spirit all over the world. And I tell you, this is only the beginning of what God is going to multiply globally. There's a multiplication of the Feast of Tabernacles. And in each case, in everywhere where the outpouring happens, you find this principle at work. The people are rediscovering the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is really the spiritual celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we all agree, right? Without the Holy Spirit, we all end up like guitars with no string, you know, totally useless, right? We end up with like pens with no ink. We are like cars with no engine. We are like spaghetti with no sauce. There's no oomph. And we become powerless. It becomes flat. And there will be no real revival until we have a fresh discovery of the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, we need a fresh encounter with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And let me end by saying this. When revival comes, we are going to see, firstly, a return to the assembling of God's people. We're going to see people flocking back to the church. There'll be a rush for seats in the house of God. Secondly, we're going to see a restoration of the Word of God. The Word of God is not given just for us to have a good time to stimulate our thinking and our mind, but the Word of God is given to instruct us on how to live. And we, the, the best response we can give to the Word of God is to obey it, that we believe it in our hearts and we will obey it in our life. And thirdly, we, through the Word of God, we will rediscover the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, we will be flat and powerless. But with the Holy Spirit, we are going to do things that, we, that man humanly cannot do. But by the Spirit... It's not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, we're going to see God usher in a mighty harvest of souls. And we say amen to this. Let's bow and we have a word of prayer. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you cause the wind of revival to continue to blow in this congregation. Lord, we will see a great return to the assembling of God's people. Every seat in this house will be filled when your Holy Spirit begins to move. Lord, you will draw the people back together in your presence again. Lord, we pray that all of us will become men and women of the Word. We will live by your scriptures. Lord, may your scripture become our compass in which we live our life. Teach us not just to read the word and believe it, but also to live it out. Lord, we are transformed, not by what we know, but by what we do. So teach us to be men and women obedient to your word. And Lord, I pray that through it all, we will rediscover the person and the power of your Holy Spirit. 
So fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.